Intel's newest Xeon has 144 cores at under 2 watts of core. It has more PCIe Gen 5 lanes. You can add memory to it by just plugging things into PCIe slots. There's onboard acceleration and so much more. We have a ton to go over today because these things are gonna redefine what servers are, so well, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is Sierra Forest, also known as the Intel Xeon 6 or 6700E series because this uses efficient cores. In this video, I'm gonna show you everything you need to know about Sierra Forest because there are things that I think a lot of people are just gonna gloss over. If you're not a server expert, you're just gonna miss these things. Now on the STH main site, we've been covering the server industry for about 15 years. And this is by far the biggest change to the Intel Xeon lineup in all of that time. And I don't mean it's even remotely close with other generations. This is absolutely huge. Now, I don't think that this is going to be the highest volume part that Intel sells in the Xeon 6 series. But on the other hand, it might be the most important because it uses all efficient cores. If you don't think that this is absolutely awesome, I'm gonna just tell you right now that by the end of this video, you are gonna think that this is phenomenal because frankly, this is the chip that I have been waiting for for like 18 plus months. I've been so excited for it. It's probably the most excited I've been for a processor since the AMD Epic Bergamo. And I'm gonna show you exactly why this is in some ways a competitor, but this one is actually not a competitor to Bergamo. With that, I do have a couple people I wanna say thank you to real quick. We're gonna say that Intel is sponsoring this video. They managed to send it these processors. You're gonna notice that we have the confidential processors. We got these things before they were released, so we could go do testing. However, they arrived uh, just after my son arrived. And so that was in the last uh, two weeks from when this is gonna be published. And so we really have not had a lot of time with these systems. We're gonna be doing a lot more follow up on the STH main site. So of course, make sure that you're looking there for more coverage. Also just kind of saying that not only do we have the QCT system that Intel was using, but we also have a super micro system that we got as a emergency system when the Intel one was a little bit delayed. It was just like the universe was conspiring against this video, but we do have to go say thank you to all the folks that make this possible. You're also probably gonna see a couple other things that folks let us borrow. So we're just gonna say that most of the stuff that you're gonna see in this was supplied by other vendors, but just kind of want to be 100% above board here. With that, let's get to what the heck these things are. Okay, so let's set the stage, at least with what even Xeon 6 is and why this is perhaps the biggest change that Intel has gone through in their entire lineup. And I don't even remember how long. So this is Sierra Forest, this is Emerald Rapids. And you see that size wise, they are pretty darn close. And that is because this is part of the 6700 series. So in the new Xeon 6, there are two different platforms. There's an eight channel platform, which is our Xeon 6700 series. There are both P and E versions. This is the E version because it uses efficient cores. There's also a P version that uses P cores. This is all gonna get very confusing, but I'm gonna make a little chart so that way it makes a little bit more sense. Now in the 6700 series, there will also be a Redwood Cove P core variant that will go up to 86 cores, which is a heck of a lot more than the you know, 64 cores that we get with Emerald Rapids. But you also see that Intel has the Intel Xeon 6900 series, and that is a 12 channel platform. And that's really the one that I think competes more directly with something like an AMD Epic, Bergamo, Genoa, or, you know, future Epic processors. Okay, and I just wanna show you this real quick. This is an AMD Epic Bergamo. This is the Sierra Forest. And you can see that it's a much smaller package, right? There's less IO for like memory channels and all that kind of stuff. And it's just a smaller package, lower TDP, all that kind of stuff. So I think Intel's idea is that the 6900 series is really gonna compete with the higher end AMD parts, but the 6700 series is gonna be kind of more of a kind of mid-market optimized part. And just to kind of give you some idea, this is the AMD Epic Sienna uh, platform. You can see that these are much more uh, it's kind of similar size parts. But the Sienna platform, which is the Epic 8004 series, only goes up to single socket. So um, this is kind of like a cool thing where this is a dual socket processor that is a much smaller and much lower cost platform. So in the larger socket that we're gonna see pretty soon, you're gonna get up to 128 performance cores. And that same socket will essentially have two of these or two of the compute tiles in these, giving you up to 288 cores per socket. And to be clear, that 288 core per socket part is really more of the competitor to something like a Bergamo that AMD has. But just to give you some sense of how crazy the Xeon 6700E series is, there are 144 core parts 
that use like 250 watts, which means that if you think your Ampere Ultra Max, which still uses DDR4, still only has PCIe Gen 4, um, well, that was 128 Neoverse and one core, so they're kind of the lower end cores, and that was still in a 250 watt package. Literally, Intel is going down to ARM levels and has faster IO, accelerators, all that kind of stuff, and they're gonna beat them on a performance or power per core basis. Now, the way that Intel's making these parts is that there are modular IO dies, which have things like your UPI for your socket to socket interconnects, it has PCIe, all that kind of stuff, and also accelerators are in those. And then the memory controllers, as well as the actual cores are in the compute tiles. So this Sierra Forest part only has one compute tile. There is another version that will have two compute tiles, and then there will be different performance core options depending on you know which which series you're in and the other important thing is that the compute tile on this is a intel 3 process whereas we have intel 7 for the io die and the importance of intel 3 can't be understated here the fact that Intel is using one of their leading process nodes for this means that they're gonna be much more competitive than they have been on a performance per core basis, partly because of the efficient core, but then also just because of the process technology really catching up to TSMC. The next version of this is Clearwater Forest, and that is the one that I think people are totally jazzed about because it's on Intel 18A, and that should really, really push things to the point that Intel may actually take the overall just performance per watt lead back from ARM again, uh, just based on that new process, right? So this is really the precursor to that. And a couple other big things about the 6700 series. The 6700 series, you get up to 88 PCIe Gen 5 lanes, and that does not include the UPI links that go from socket to socket. Now, while we're on the platform level, there are two other things I wanna talk about. First, these chips do support CXL memory. Here's what one looks like. This is an Astero Labs Aurora 1000 platform. And just to kind of give you some idea of what you might use something like this for, what you can do is you can actually take DIMMs and put them into here, and then you plug it into a PCIe slot, which will run CXL, and then you add memory. So we have 64 gig DIMMs in here. There's four of them, so that's 256 gigabytes of memory. You put this into a PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slot, and it gives you roughly about like two memory channels, I think, worth of bandwidth. Now, one of the systems that we have is using 64 gig DIMMs in all 32 slots, so we get about two terabytes of memory. But what you can do is you can go put CXL devices in there and add easily another terabyte if you wanted to get to three. And the other huge platform change that I think a lot of people are going to miss is the fact that you no longer have a PCH or platform controller hub. Those PCHs actually used well over 10 watts of power. So even if you had TDPs on your CPUs that were like 250 watts each or something like that, by having that PCH, you'd have like another 10, 15 watts or whatever, just kind of sitting on the motherboard that nobody ever really talked about, but it was present when you looked at system power consumption. AMD Epic has never had a PCH, so it's always been a difference and it's kind of been, to me at least, a disadvantage to the Intel platforms. And now that they've gotten rid of it, they have a much more modern IO stack. So now that we've talked about the platform, Let's talk a little bit more in depth about the chips and what it means to be an E-Core versus a P-Core in this generation. A lot of people think that an E-Core just sucks and that's like kind of life, like E-Core is like from the old Atom line, so it must be horrible. But frankly, um, the Crestmont cores are actually pretty darn fast these days. They're more equivalent to something like a late Xeon E5, maybe early Skylake or something like that, just in terms of performance, as long as you're you know, like Skylake, you don't look at AVX 512 and all that kind of stuff. I mean, so these things are actually pretty darn fast little cores and Intel has a ton of them. And something when you look at our 144 core CPUs, you'll see immediately is that these Cresma cores are organized into groups of four. These four cores have four megabytes of level two shared cache, and they also have a overall chip level three cache, which honors like, I think like 108 gig or megabytes or something like that. The other thing though that's missing from these E cores is of course, hyper-threading. These are one core, one thread processors. And that is a huge deal. If you're still using something like a Xeon E5 or a Skylake, so first-gen Intel Xeon scalable server, well, um, all those Spectre meltdown vulnerabilities, um, you know, those, those hit you pretty hard in those generations just because folks hadn't really realized that those were a big deal yet. And the chips at the time just weren't built to go and handle all of the side channel attacks brought by having SMT on. And so with Sierra Forest, you only have one core, one thread, so you, you don't really have to worry about that. And that's also the reason that a lot of the ARM chips don't have multiple threads per core. 
Okay, so let's talk about the performance of these chips. And I just want to get it out real quick that these things, again, are not supposed to be a Bergamo competitor. I think that's really what the 288 core Sierra Forest AP part is going to be later this year. Intel went and did a comparison between 128 core Sierra Forest versus 128 core Epic, and you get better performance per watt, but not necessarily always better performance. And that's probably the idea. So when we tested these, something that's interesting is just depending on how applications scale with things like having physical cores, how they scale with things like having physical versus, you know, hyper-threaded cores, and, uh, you know, how they scale among all of the cores, so the less single-threaded workloads tend to do well, you know, we saw actually really good performance. And when we do like our virtualization testing and stuff, these things are actually pretty darn awesome. Now, when we had the Intel Xeon 6780E installed, which is the up to three gigahertz all core turbo parts, something that I was really surprised about is that those things actually ran at three gigahertz. Like we had them running in systems and they would just sit pegged at three gigahertz. It's not one of those things where a couple of those cores will hit three gigahertz and a couple of them will sit at much lower speed. These things all do pretty darn well. And that is really the purpose of this because this is a processor designed for having lots of VMs, putting them onto a processor and just doing massive consolidation. Now we also had the Intel Xeon 6766E, which was also 144 core part, but instead of being 330 watts, it was only 250 watts. That one also hit 2.7 gigahertz across the board. And it was literally like, okay, you're gonna drop your performance by about 10% ish. And you're also gonna, save a lot of power. It was kind of like one of those deals where you give up 10% in your clock speed, so you lose 10% ish of performance, but you're also losing about 24% of the overall power consumption of just the packages. Of course, system power consumption is not that high, but it's still a lot of power savings. And before you say 2.7 gigahertz is not very fast, just go back and look at the clock speeds of things like the Intel Xeon E5 V4 series. Look at the Skylake ones. And like that was actually a pretty decent clock speed back then. And remember the idea of these processors is literally to go take those servers out and replace tons of them with single servers. But next, I want to talk a little bit about power. Now, we had two systems. We had the QCT development system and also the Supermicro system. We did not get to go do our full power testing, but just to give you some idea of what the difference was, we ran the 330 watt TDP, 144 core, three gigahertz parts at their maximum. We just, just jammed those things using Stress NG. And when we did that, the package power consumption went from about 75 watts per CPU up to that 320 ish 330 watt range and so you definitely saw those processors just kind of jump in terms of their overall power consumption but the overall power consumption at the server level just topped just barely over 900 watts now when we looked at the 6766e's which are the 2.7 gigahertz max parts that are only 250 watts you're saving 80 watts per cpu and so that's a total of 160 watts meaning that we were in that like mid 700 watt range for 288 cores in a system i also want to point out though that these power measurements are being done with a full set of dims so we have 64 gigabyte dims 32 sockets for two terabytes of memory we also have a 100 gig nick a quad 10 gigabit nick and so normally when we do power consumption we only do single dim per channel but because uh well we ran out of time that's what we have here but that would lower the power consumption even more i would not be surprised if you could get systems that ran at under 700 watts for 288 cores if you're doing one dim per channel with the 6766e so if you're taking nine of those 500 watt systems so about 4.5 kilowatts worth of just cpu power right in systems and you manage to consolidate that into something that's like 700 or maybe 800 watts of power i mean frankly you are winning at your power budget a lot of people need more power these days to go power ai servers so they need more power in their data centers and this is an awesome way to go do that it sounds like we're getting to key lessons learned so we'll let's get to that next so what did we learn from this entire exercise uh to me the big thing is really that these processors are number one not the right processors for every application if you need the maximum performance per core these are wrong and that means that things like maybe for vmware installations if you're still running vmware i would go with a p core for that because you want more performance per core and so emerald rapids or granite rapids seems like a better fit now on the other hand 
if you have things like you're running MySQL databases and or MariaDB databases, you have things like Nginx proxies, or maybe you have Nginx web servers or something like that, these things are absolute monsters. They offer absolutely crazy consolidation ratios. And you know the idea that you can have 288 cores in a 500 watt TDP combined power budget, that is absolutely crazy guys. And to me, the idea with these processors is that you really should be exploiting that idea that you're, you know, little under two watts per core, you should be using that as a guide to go and consolidate. So if you have all these little VMs that are just sitting there running whatever services, uh, get the CRFRS things, get those old servers out of your data center so you can go and put AI servers in. But I think it's important at this point to take a step back, right? We know the market for these chips, which is basically if you have low power VMs that just kind of need cores and you know you want to go put those on something that doesn't use a lot of power, the power efficiency of these things is phenomenal because Intel is finally getting their process and their foundry game going again. But the bigger implication is really what Intel is doing. Intel Xeon is no longer, okay, here's our P-Core, good luck, and we're just gonna scale from Xeon Bronze all the way up to Xeon Platinum. The idea of just having one core and really having, you know, the performance being dictated by, okay, well, here's the number of cores you get, here's a clock speed, we're gonna mess with the memory speed a little bit and just kind of like, good luck, right? That's no longer the case. Instead, Intel is essentially has four different lines of Xeon processors that are coming out. By having four different options, you can now pick between having E-cores in a platform and a lower power platform, which is this. There's also P-core options. So if you validate an entire server, you can pick P-core, E-core. And if you wanna go to a higher end platform, that's what we're gonna have next when we start seeing 128 core Granite Rapids. There's also gonna be a Sierra Forest, a 288 cores, the Sierra Forest AP. And that is just, I can't wait for that part, guys. I mean, that is gonna be absolutely crazy for consolidation. And hey guys, let's face it, you might look at this and say, cool, Patrick, I get it, Sierra Forest today, but I'm not gonna go and adopt a first gen technology. Well, let me give you a couple thoughts. Like one, uh, the next generation of these Clearwater Forests, people are just freaking jazzed about because I think uh, they're gonna be pretty awesome. We can't really talk about them yet, but hopefully we will in the future. But uh, definitely get ready for that because eCore, I would say, has a very vibrant line. And if you look at what is happening on the consumer side, you might kind of get an understanding or at least an idea of why. And also, let's just face it, if you have anything, let's say you have a low power rack or something like that, and you just kind of need more cores. I mean, how old is a 16 core in a socket system? How old does that look when you have processors that now have 144 cores and you know you're going up to 288 cores in in like the next couple months. And if you say, hey, I can't afford it today, remember that same concept is gonna work in your home lab in the future. And hey guys, I really wanna hear what you think about these new processors. I'm so jazzed by it. Um, these things have to be one of the more fun things that we've ever used and ever touched at STH. I'm super jazzed by the whole idea of these cloud native processors. I love to hear what you think though. And so why don't you drop a little line in the comments and let me know what you think. But also send this video to your colleagues so they can learn all about the new Xeon EE. Also give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.